It is November 29, 2006. We're here on the campus of Rutgers University at the Eagleton Institute of Politics. This is another in the series of video interviews for the Brendan T. Byrne Archive, which is being compiled by the Rutgers program on the governor. I'm Don Linke, uh, and we're here this morning to talk to Barry H. Evanchik. Barry has been one of the closest uh, and oldest uh, friends and advisors to Governor Brendan Byrne over many, many years, and we'll explore the various roles and relationships he's had with Governor Byrne. Barry, why don't we start with how Brendan Byrne first came into your life, and it started a very long journey, I think, with him. But why don't we start there? Sure. Um, I guess the year was 1964. I was uh, fulfilling a six-month uh, military obligation at, uh, at McGuire Air Force Base. And, um, and uh, I had uh, read in the Newark Evening News, which was still in existence then, uh, about the retirement of an assistant Essex County uh, prosecutor named Bill Caruso. Bill Caruso, according to the story, had been in charge of the appellate section of the Essex Prosecutor's Office, which at the time was headed by Brendan T. Byrne. Um, and so I decided I would write a letter to Mr. Byrne, whom I did not know, uh, and, and say in the letter that I had clerked for an appellate division judge, Judge Lewis, and ask if I could be interviewed. And as a result of that, uh, there came the fateful day in my life when uh, when I was uh, informed that I would have an interview with Prosecutor Byrne at his home in West Orange on a given Saturday. I was home uh, from uh, uh, the base for the weekend and, um, and off I went to Dogwood Road in West Orange to meet uh, Mr. Byrne and to have my interview. And uh, when I got to the house, I nervously rang the doorbell and there was no response. And I rang the bell again and no response. And so I quickly came to the conclusion I must have somehow made a mistake and I guess this isn't when I was to be interviewed. And I, I walked back down the, the sidewalk heading for my car and I suddenly heard noise coming from behind the house. And, and so I walked up the driveway and there in the backyard was a man who proved to be Prosecutor Byrne and a young kid who was Tom Byrne, his son, and they were having a catch. And I got into the catch and uh, my left hand still, I think, smarts from catching the ball that Tommy Byrne was throwing. But Brendan invited me inside. I didn't call him Brendan in those days, I assure you, but he invited me inside for the interview. and. Uh, and the interview went something like this. He looked at my resume and he said, uh, you went to Milburn High School. Do you know Frank Close? And I said, sure, Frank Close is, is our football coach, baseball coach. He said, I played football with Frank Close at West Orange High School. And we talked about Frank Close. And then he said, looking again at my resume, I see that you rode on the crew team at Rutgers. And I said, that, that's true, I was never much of a, of a uh, superstar. In fact, I never made it past the JV shell, but I did do that. And we talked about crew and rowing and various other things. And at the end of the interview, I thanked him and went home and my, my parents were waiting to find out how the interview went. And my father said, well, how was the interview? I said, well, you know, I, I, I'm not sure. I was fun. I, I, we talked about crew and we talked about Frank Close. I don't remember talking about law. I'm sure we did, but I have no recollection of it. In any event, I thus began a, a period of weeks where I didn't hear anything. And of course, I was approaching the end of my six months active duty and, and wanting to know that I had a job. I was uh, engaged, or I think I was engaged, and, and was to be married, and, and I still didn't have a job. And, uh, and one day, again, weeks later, I was at home in Milburn at my parents' house, and the phone rang. I think it was also a Saturday. And a voice said, Barry, this is uh, Prosecutor Byrne. I 
yes, sir. He said, I've decided to give you a shot at this thing. That was the way he put it. And I said, oh, well, thank you very much. That's just wonderful news. He said, um, I want you to call Dennis Carey and tell him that I have decided to uh, hire you. I said, sure, I'll do that. Who is Dennis Carey? <laughs> <And> <laughs> He told me Dennis Carey was a Democratic chairman of Essex County. And uh, I, I, Monday morning, I looked up Mr. Carey's number in the phone book and called. And the secretary said, no, Mr. Carey is unavailable. The next time, Mr. Carey is in Washington. The third time, Mr. Carey is somewhere else. I never got to talk to Dennis Carey. Came the day in January of 1965 when I was sworn in as an assistant Essex County prosecutor. And uh, uh, I remember when I got to the courthouse, the first assistant, Van, the late Van Y. Clinton, said to me, uh, what Democrat judge do you want to swear you in? I said, I, I don't know any judges, Democrat or otherwise. So he called uh, John Crane, who was sitting as a Superior Court judge in Essex in those days and asked John Crane if he would swear me in. And in those days, the swearing in of a new assistant prosecutor was a major event. I mean, the whole office turned out for it, uh, family, friends, you, you would think you were being invested as, a, as an archbishop. But in any event, uh, my wife-to-be could not be there because she was in New York working at her job and couldn't get away, but my future father-in-law was there and I remember well after the swearing in ceremony we're out in the hallway and I I proudly introduced my new boss prosecutor Byrne to my father-in-law to be and uh, and uh, the first words I remember Byrne uttering to my father-in-law uh, were I guess you're glad he's got a job <laughs> <laughs> thus began my uh, time as an assistant Essex County prosecutor under Brendan Byrne it was an extraordinary uh, time. Uh, the office, even then, had the reputation of being one of the best law enforcement offices in the whole country, all because of the leadership and the ability and the skills <coughs> of Brendan Byrne. <coughs> so to be in that office was really uh, a privilege. And I was hired to, to be an appellate prosecutor, meaning I got to write briefs and argue cases, I've often thought that my first time in any courtroom in the world probably was in the Supreme Court of New Jersey. I just happened to be there at the time a case was coming up for argument and I was assigned to argue it and I did. And I've said ever since my career started at the top, it's probably been going downhill ever since. But in any event, um, I got to argue cases before the Supreme Court, before the Appellate Division, and um, had a reasonably close relationship with Prosecutor Byrne, but when I say close, uh, I mean where there were only two or three of us who were handling appeals. Brendan had a particular interest in appellate advocacy, in part because the then Chief Justice Weintraub was, was truly Brendan Byrne's mentor. And Brendan cherished the relationship between Weintraub and, and him, as well as the relationship that the office had uh, and the, and the uh, prestige that it enjoyed uh, before the Supreme Court of New Jersey. And so any time one of his assistants went off to the Supreme Court, it was a very special event. And to be in the appellate office in those days was, was fun and it was, and it was interesting. Before we go too much further, you said you didn't know Brendan Byrne before you sent the letter asking for a job. But you said you had heard of the reputation of the office. What else had you had heard about Brendan Byrne before you met him? Very little about him personally at that time, more about the office. I wanted, uh, in in the days right after my graduation from law school. What I really wanted to do was become an assistant United States attorney. A fellow named David Satz was the U.S. attorney in those days. And a neighbor of mine in Milburn was a personal friend of uh, David Satz and had arranged for me to have an interview with Satz. And I had that interview, and that was the job I really wanted, frankly, more than anything else. 
and I remember Sat saying to me, well, uh, I don't have an opening now, but I have you right at the top of my list, and if, uh, as soon as we have an opening, I will call you. And I had several of those conversations. Along the way, I also had my interview with Byrne, but I must confess, <coughs> Byrne was really not my first choice. However, it was the first uh, offer that I received, and I, and I, looking back now, it's so lucky for me and for my career that that's the way it worked out. But I didn't know him and really didn't know much about him or hadn't heard much about him other than that he was a young fellow in his 30s, I guess, at the time, and that he was the head of this prestigious office. And I guess from your remarks about uh, your ignorance of who Dennis Carey was that you weren't politically very astute at the time. I, I was not, but you know, it's interesting. I remember in the office at that time, among the assistants was a fellow named Joe Glavin. Joe Glavin was the uh, son-in-law of Dennis Carey. And one day, early in my career, I was on the elevator in the old courthouse, crowded elevator, and Joe Glavin was there. And lo and behold, he turned to a man to his left and said, Dad, I want to introduce our newest assistant prosecutor. This is Barry Evanchik. Oh, yes, he said. Uh, you're, uh, I wish you well. And then I was astonished when Mr. Carey said, you clerked for Judge Arthur Lewis, as I recall. I said, yes, sir, I did. He said, well, he said, you, you, uh, you had a fine clerkship and just do a good job as an assistant. And I said, I'll try it. And that was that. But you know, I was astonished because here was this powerful political leader I never in, in my wildest imagination figured he would be aware of such minutia as, as who this young kid assistant prosecutor had clerked for, but, lo, but he did, he did know. And anyhow, um, that was how I finally met him. But I had absolutely no political connections. In fact, when I was waiting for an answer from Byrne, my uh, father-in-law said, you know, I know so-and-so who's a friend of the prosecutors. Why don't I call and, and see if I can get you know, a word in on your behalf. And I had a streak in me, I guess I still do, that went something like this. I want to get this job on my own if I can. I don't want anybody helping me. I always, I would always wonder how come I got hired. So I said to my father-in-law, please, don't do it. <coughs> <He's> <coughs> excuse me. He said to me, that's ridiculous. I said, well, ridiculous or not, I don't want to even try to exert any sort of influence, and that was the way it went. So I started my job without the slightest connection to anybody in politics, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's, the way, that's the way it went. When Prosecutor Byrne asked you to call Dennis Carey, were you a little concerned, or did you get advice from your father-in-law again? No, I, I wasn't concerned. A, I really didn't know much about him, didn't know who he was. All I know, knew was that Byrne had asked me to call him, and after I tried four or five times, I gave up. I decided, well, I, you know, I tried. Hmm. And, you know, and I remember later telling uh, Brendan Byrne that I had not been able to reach Dennis Carey, and he said, well, you, you know, don't worry about it. Um, I learned later that, you know, Byrne had, and still does, a tremendous independence. The last thing he was about to do as prosecutor of Essex County was have his appointments influenced by anybody. He wanted to do it on his terms and so forth. But nonetheless, he was astute enough to recognize that, as a courtesy at least, um, it was important to let the county chairman know of the appointments that he was about to make. And that's why he asked me to call him, uh, to call Carey. But no, I didn't have a clue who Dennis Carey was. At what point? In your political education, did you learn of the sort of political circumstances surrounding the appointment as acting prosecutor of Brendan Byrne in, in Essex County? It wasn't until years later um, when, um, when, well, it was, it was near the time that I decided to try my hand at writing a biography of Brendan Byrne, which I am engaged in doing now, and I, I hope will be concluded in the not-too-distant future. Mm. So does Brendan hope so. He mm. keeps asking me, by the way. 
hey, Barry, when is this book going to be finished? You know, I'd like to read it in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. But um, it, was, uh, it was only some years ago that I heard in some detail the story of how he became the acting prosecutor and eventually the prosecutor at the time that Governor Minor uh, was governor. And of course, as you know, uh, Brendan was Minor's executive assistant. And, uh, and um, it, it's my recollection that, uh, that Byrne's appointment as prosecutor ran into a little bit of political difficulty that had nothing to do particularly with, with Byrne as much as it did with some other person that, that the political powers in Essex County wanted to see named as prosecutor. And eventually Minor, Minor resolved that problem by appointing that person to something else in which, in, and, and the whatever objection there may have been to Byrne was, was removed and he became a prosecutor. Mm -hmm. There was a story I didn't hear about until only relatively recently. Barry, before we go further into uh, your tenure in the prosecutor's office and in the subsequent positions, uh, why don't we uh, get at least a somewhat brief overview of your upbringing, family, uh, background, and education up to the point that we've just lived? Well, I was uh, born in Newark uh, at Beth Israel Hospital back in 1938. My family lived in Newark uh, until 1950 when my parents uh, bought their first and only home in, in Milburn, and uh, we moved uh, to Milburn uh, then, and um, I finished the sixth grade at a school called the South Mountain School in Milburn, where one of my grandchildren is now in kindergarten and um, then went to Milburn High School, from which I graduated in 1956. Just two Saturday nights ago, by the way, I attended my 50th high school yeah. reunion, which was a fun event, hard to believe, 50 mm -hmm. years ago. After uh, Milburn High School, I went off to Rutgers here in New Brunswick and uh, graduated from Rutgers in uh, 1960 and then uh, began my law school career at Rutgers Law School in Newark from which I graduated in 1963. My clerkship then was with Judge Arthur Lewis. Well, let me stop you a little bit. Since this is a Rutgers project, why yeah. don't we talk a little bit more about your years at Rutgers, uh, what courses you liked, what professors you remember, yeah. both, both uh, as an undergrad and as a law student. I came to Rutgers with a bit of a chip on my shoulder, I will also confess, as I confessed to something else a few minutes ago. Um, my classmates at Milburn high school or off to the Ivy League and various other places. I had wanted to go to Colgate, which was really my first choice. And my parents couldn't afford that. I was a, accepted at Colgate, but my parents could not afford Colgate or any of the other schools that I really would have preferred in those days going to. Rutgers was a fallback application. And I was accepted there, and off I went in 1956, but as I say, I was feeling as if life had dealt me a bit of a low blow, uh, you know, feeling a little sorry for myself. Of course, it wasn't long before I came to know what a great university Rutgers was and is, and I uh, uh, became involved in, in various activities. I mentioned before my great career on the crew team, but I ran track. I, re I remember, by the way, my, my first weeks down at Rutgers in September, I guess, of 1956, I went off to the gym on University Avenue and asked the athletic director, Harry Rockefeller, I think was his name, if I could sign a discus out of the equipment room, because I had thrown the discus on the track team at Milburn High School, and I wanted to go up to the heights and practice. So they gave me a discus and I went up to the heights. At the heights in those days, there was the Selman Waxman building, and I don't think, uh, and the football stadium, and that was about it. Mm -hmm. Everything else was just bare woods and so forth. And I was all by myself up at the heights, working on my discus throwing, and out of no place came this big tall fella, and I remember he said to me, he said, what do you call that thing? And I said, well, it's a discus. He said, really? He said, can I try it? I said, sure. And you know, I handed him the discus, and he proceeded to throw it, 
out of sight. I mean, <laughs> probably set some sort of a world's <laughs> record. It was the first time he had ever done it. He introduced himself. He said, my name's Bob Sims. Mm -hmm. And Bob Sims turned out to be another in a line of Sims who had played football for Rutgers. Bob was in my class, and we, got, we became friends as a result of the discus story. And Sims was a great superstar for Rutgers, later signed by the New York Giants, by mm -hmm. the way, and was played for the Giants for a while. And I'm, I believe Bob is a very successful financial person in New York uh, nowadays. But that was uh, <clears throat> my freshman year. I was on something called the Ledge Committee. The, the Ledge was the name of the new student union building that had been constructed along the Raritan River along with the three new, then new dormitories. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember also in my freshman year, um, I was living in, in uh, not one of the three new dorms, but an, another dormitory. But I recall walking across the campus one day and, and taking what I thought was the Targum, the Rutgers newspaper, out of one of the assembly points there. And I see the headline, New Dormitory to be Raised, R-A-Z-E-D. And the story was that, that Hardenberg, I think, was the name of one of the three. It was determined that the steel that had been used for the construction of Hardenberg Dormitory was supposed to go into a pigsty out in, in the Midwest somewhere. And by mistake, they used it on the dormitory. And it was unsafe. And they were going to have to mm -hmm. knock the building down. I couldn't believe it. This magnificent new dormitory was going to have to come down. And I walked across the campus to the shed of one of the plumbing contractors who was still at work on these new dorms. I, he was a friend of my dad's, and I used to hitch a ride home to Milburn with him on some weekends. And I, I said to him, his name was Sam Scola. I remember his son became a lawyer in New Jersey. And I said to him, Sam, look at the Rutgers newspaper. Here's the story. One of these buildings that you just built is going to have to come down. And he looked at it, and he cracked up. He said, Barry, look at the headline. This isn't the Targum. It's the Mugrat, which is Targum spelled backwards. Yeah. And they would occasionally put out one of these phony papers. I had swallowed the story <laughs> hook, line, and sinker. Um, my first year, in fact, my first two years at Rutgers were in part occupied by, by a uh, girl that I was dating rather seriously who was going to school out in Pennsylvania at a place called Wilson College. And I had a roommate along the way named Joel Murphy who was also dating a girl who was going to school out in Pennsylvania. And so Murphy and I would occasionally leave to see our girlfriends for the weekend, but we would leave on a Tuesday or, or Wednesday. And as a result of all that horsing around, uh, I found myself in a certain amount of academic difficulty where I would be getting warnings. I tried to keep them from my parents, but in those days they'd be sent directly home. You know, you, you, your, your son is not working in accord with aptitude, et cetera. The result of all of that was that my first two years were anything but, but outstanding academically. I mean, I was just getting average grades or, or so. And so by my junior year, I guess it was around my junior year that I decided I might want to go to law school. I had no particular attachment to the law, but neither did I have a clue what else I wanted to do with myself. I was a poli-sci major because everybody who might have any interest in becoming a lawyer majored in poli-sci in those days, or at least many people did. It was believed to be an appropriate major leading to law school. And I went to see my advisor, Dr. Benjamin Baker, and he was one of my favorite professors and a terrific person. And I said, Dr. Baker, I think I'd like to go to law school. And he looked at my record and he said, Barry, you, I don't think you better, you better think of something else because it's unlikely that you're going to get in. Well, the good news for me was that my grades improved substantially uh, as I stopped running out to Pennsylvania mm -hmm. by that time and uh, got you know, kind of buckled down. And my grades really went substantially upwards mm. in my junior and senior years, so that by the time I approached the end of my undergraduate career, I was uh, able to uh, get into a law school. I applied to three law schools, Rutgers, uh, NYU, and, uh, and uh, Virginia. Mm 
and I was accepted at NYU, but again, it was financially just not feasible. And so I went off to Rutgers, had a small scholarship, which, for which I have been eternally grateful. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, by the time I graduated from the undergraduate school, I had grown to love it passionately. It was, it was a wonderful place um, to, to go to school. And, uh, and then Rutgers turned out to be equally wonderful. So I'm a, I'm a uh, devoted uh, Rutgers uh, person mm. and uh, always have been and I'm sure always will be. What courses, either in law school or as an undergrad, did you most enjoy? Um, in undergraduate school, I remember loving history taught by Dr. McCormick's father, mm -hmm. by the way, uh, who was a favorite professor of undergraduates in those days. I also enjoyed a music course I took under Professor Soup Walter, who was the director of the Rutgers Glee Club and, and a wonderful man, and, and the, the course was, was, was fascinating. I remember that a lot of the football team took that course because it was reputed to be you know, a, an easy course, but I took it because I had a, an interest then and still do in music. Anyway, mm -hmm. that was fun. And, uh, Is that what started your interest in the violin? No, my interest in the violin started when I was about eight years old and I was rummaging around the attic of, of, of an aunt of mine who lived in Newark and I found an old violin that had been her son's and uh, uh, my parents had the violin fixed up and I began to take violin lessons from a man named Sam Applebaum who lived in Newark, uh, off Clinton Avenue in Newark and who had his studio right in his home. And if you were a kid of my age and had any interest in the violin in those days, the likelihood is you took lessons from Sam Applebaum. And, and I began to take lessons and, and enjoyed it immensely. And um, I mean, my parents did not have to force me to practice. I actually enjoyed practicing. And there came a time when I was about 15, then living in Melbourne, when Sam Applebaum's son, Michael Applebaum, uh, who was a student himself, a violin student at the Curtis Institute in Philadelphia, uh, was to have a pupil. It, Ap uh, Michael was studying under the world-renowned violinist Ephraim Zimbalist, mm -hmm. father of Ephraim Zimbalist Jr., the actor. And apparently it was decided that for Michael's development as a concert artist, he should have a, a student. And so I became his first student and switched from getting lessons from Mr. Applebaum to his son, Michael. And Michael used to come to my house in Milburn and, and give me my lesson. I think lessons in those days cost $3 for a half hour, <laughs> roughly. Uh, that's when my interest in the violin really began and continued right up until the time I was about a senior in high school when what with throwing the discus mm -hmm. on the track team and girls and whatever mm -hmm. else, I decided I didn't have time for lessons anymore. And um, I told Mr. Applebaum that I was going to stop taking lessons for a while. And I remember he said to me, you know, that's fine. I understand. He said, but uh, anybody can be a discus thrower, but not everybody can play the violin. He said, I have many pupils who are professionals, adults. You'll come back to it one day. And he was right. Um, many years later, I went to see him, then a, an elderly man living in Maplewood, and asked him if I could uh, get more lessons. And he said, well, I'm, I'm too old. I don't have many pupils. But he gave me some music and a music stand. And he said, go home and practice and come back. And uh, that was the last time I saw Sam Applebaum. He passed away shortly thereafter. But I have remained friends and in touch with his son Michael. Michael changed his name along the way from Applebaum to Tree and he is today Michael Tree, the world famous violist with mm. the Guarneri String Quartet, mm. which is one of the most wonderful quartets in the whole world. And Michael and I uh, play tennis together occasionally and, and in fact my wife and I will be going over to the 92nd Street Y in a couple of weeks to hear Michael performing with the, with the Guarneri. Mm -hmm. My music interest has never waned, and my love of the violin continues. Uh, I hope to resume some lessons soon, not because I expect to be going to Carnegie Hall, but because uh, 
at least not as a performer, but at least for my own enjoyment. Uh, I, as I say, I, I still love it. Now, you said you applied to law school without any great driven commitment to becoming a lawyer. Uh, did you develop that while you were in law school? Yeah, I, I did. Um, I loved law school. I probably did the best in my whole life academically in law school. Uh, I had great professors at Rutgers. Rutger. Mm, you know, who specifically? Well, specifically, uh, Clarence Clyde Ferguson, Jr. comes immediately to mind. Clyde Ferguson was, in those days, uh, uh, known as, interestingly, probably the first and only African-American teaching at a so-called all-white law school. Clyde was a favorite of all of the students. He was brilliant. He was a wonderful professor. And in 1962, my second year of law school, he was appointed by President Kennedy to be the first general counsel of the United States Commission on Civil Rights. And he left the faculty at the law school to take on that assignment. And he invited me down to Washington that summer um, to be his uh, law clerk. And, and I did that, and it was one of the extraordinary experiences of my life. The staff director of the Civil Rights Commission, a fellow named Burl Bernhard, uh, was a close friend of Ted Sorensen, mm -hmm. who was, of course, Kennedy's right-hand man in those days. As a result of the Bernhard Sorensen connection, we students working at the Civil Rights Commission got invited one day to the White House for a reception by President Kennedy, which I will never forget. And, um, and, but Clyde Ferguson became a close personal friend. Interesting story about Clyde. He, after being the first general counsel of the Civil Rights Commission, uh, became the dean of the Howard Law School in Washington. And, and after that, he became Under Secretary of State for African Affairs. And after that, the American ambassador to Uganda. All, still, uh, he was a relatively young person. <coughs> and then Clyde uh, went off to Harvard Law School, where he had been a student, from which he had graduated, and joined the faculty. As, as I recall, he was the first non-law review person to be named to the Harvard faculty in those days. But in any event, uh, to step back a bit, when Ferguson was the dean at the Howard Law School, and the story I'm about to tell you, he told me. <clears throat> while we were having lunch on Broad Street in Newark one day, Lyndon Johnson was president. There was not yet an African American on the United States Supreme Court. Ferguson had gained prominence in legal affairs and found himself the subject of a front page story in the Washington Post to the effect that it was commonly believed that Lyndon Johnson wanted to be the first president to name a a black to the United States Supreme Court, and Ferguson was first among a short list of people supposedly under close consideration. Ferguson was aware of this story in the Washington Post. About a week later, he was up at Harvard teaching for the summer. He was still the dean of the Howard Law School, but he was up in Cambridge teaching. A student came to get him and said, you have a call from the president. Ferguson figured, this is it lightning is about to strike, goes to the phone booth or to the phone. And a voice said, good morning, Dean Ferguson. He said, good morning, Mr. President. Trembling, figuring. And Linda Johnson said, Dean, I'm calling to tell you that I am today sending your name to the Senate for the membership on the District of Columbia Crime Commission. <laughs> Ferguson said he almost collapsed. That's when Thurgood Marshall was named to the U.S. Supreme Court. Hmm. But Clyde Ferguson was not just my favorite professor or among my favorites, but everybody's. Willard Heckel was another great hmm. professor and became a close personal friend at the Rutgers Law School. Malcolm Talbot. There were, there were many wonderful professors. And hmm. so my memories of uh, my law school career are, are, hmm. are uh, etched in my brain and will always be uh, 
among my favorite memories. I wanted to explore somewhat more your Washington uh, experience. Uh, what was that meeting at the White House like? You know, it was just so wonderful. It took place outside, just in, on the South Lawn, just a few feet from the Rose Garden. And I remember that Kennedy came out looking like a movie star, tanned and, you know, in his Navy suit. <coughs> and he got up on a little soapbox to speak to, there were probably 150 of us assembled there. And I recall as he spoke, um, Pierre Salinger was standing in his shirt sleeves, big cigar in his hand, his mouth, and leaning up against the door to the Oval Office watching all of this. And Kennedy got up and greeted all of us. And you talk about magnetism and, and charisma. I mean, it, it just exuded from, from the man. And he welcomed us and, and talked about career, a career in politics and uh, told us uh, to consider that. And I remember his last words were something like this, so, so come and join us. The water's fine. Come on in. And, and um, I have a, at home in my library the papers of John F. Kennedy, which are in three volumes. And somewhere in volume two, they actually printed every speech he ever gave. And I can go back and occasionally do and read the remarks he gave to us at the reception. And it was as if, as if it all happened yesterday. I can remember them so well. That was 1962. I, I, um, because of the staff director, Burl Bernhard's friendship with Sorensen, uh, I asked Bernhard if he, if he could assist me in getting a job with Sorensen at the White House after my graduation in 1963. And Bernhard did uh, make an effort. In fact, uh, I got a letter, which I still have, on White House stationery from Sorensen saying that he didn't have an opening at that time, but knowing that I would be graduating in 1963, he would be in touch. Well, I was clerking for Judge Lewis in the appellate division in, um, in 1963. In fact, I was having lunch with my boss, Judge Lewis, the day of the assassination. And um, remember, as we all do who were around in those days, I remember vividly everything that happened that day. The, horrible news that the president had been assassinated. I went to Judge Lewis's home out in Centennial Lake in Burlington County, and we had coffee and, like the rest of the world, watched television. And that night, I recall driving home to Milburn. I was still single. Uh, I remember driving up the turnpike on that Friday evening, and it was, it was surreal. The traffic was going slowly. It was just the world seemed as if it had almost come to an end. And um, in fact, on, on Sunday uh, of that weekend, my kid sister and a classmate at Milburn High School, who later was my best man, and I got in my car. We drove down to Washington for the cortege. Took our place, I remember, on uh, Pennsylvania Avenue to watch uh, as the cortege would be coming from the White House, the horse-drawn carriage and so forth. A huge crowd of people. It was a pretty day in November. And uh, as, as we were standing there, I remember the word came through the crowd like an electric shock that Lee Harvey Oswald had been shot. And it seemed then as if, my God, the world is coming to an end. And I remember the carriage coming along, and we were standing very near to where the procession turned into the Capitol Rotunda. And I could see that happen, and I could hear the Navy band playing the Navy hymn as, as an honor guard carried that casket up the steps. And I tell you, there wasn't a dry eye in the world watching that. Um, I thought it was somewhat sacrilegious, but nevertheless, I had a camera with me, and I took pictures of all of that, which I still have. Uh, but um, uh, many years later, on the humorous side, I was um, uh, a partner in a law firm in Newark called Hellring, Lindemann, Goldstein, and Siegel. Uh, 
at the time. And um, I went off to a week-long meeting of the National Conference of Commissioners on Uniform State Laws, to which I had been appointed by Brendan Byrne when he was governor. And um, successive governors have reappointed me, so I'm still doing that. It's 25 years later, and I'm still a New Jersey commissioner. We had gone off for the annual meeting of the conference, and when I came home on whatever Sunday it was, I went down to Newark to the Hellring firm to check my messages and see what had happened in the week before. And there on a pink message sheet was a message that Ted Sorensen called. Sorensen was then and still is a partner in a prominent New York law firm. Um, and the message was, Ted Sorensen called to refer a new matter to you. And I looked at this thing and I said, my God, Ted Sorensen calling to refer a case to me? It was extraordinary. I couldn't wait till Monday morning. Oh, the message said, we'll call back on Monday. Monday morning, I got to the office, waiting anxiously for the call. It didn't come. And about 10 o'clock, I did the uncool thing. I decided I'm going to call him. So I called uh, over to the, uh, to the firm and asked to speak to him. And they said, Mr. Sorensen isn't in and so forth. He should be in around 11. I left word who I was and so forth. Again, no call. So I picked up the phone at around 11.30 and called again. And this time, he answered. I recognized his voice. He said, hello. I said, Mr. Sorensen, yes. This is Barry Evanschick. There's a pregnant pause. And he said, yes. I said, well, I, I'm returning your call of this past Friday about a new matter. He said, Mr. Evanschick, do we know each other? I said, well, I, I certainly know you. You don't know me. He said, look, I'm awfully sorry. I don't, I don't know where this comes from, but I didn't call you. And I said, well, I'm with a firm called Hellring Lindemann. No, he said, I, you know, he said, there's someone else here at the firm that, whose name is somewhat similar. Maybe he called. I'll tell him about our conversation. And I said to him, well, look, this gives me a chance to say hello. And I said, uh, I will tell you that about 30 odd years ago, I applied to you for a job at the Kennedy White House. And I still have a letter that you sent me saying that you would keep my name in mind. And Sorensen paused again and he said, so you figured 30 odd years later I was calling to tell you whether or not you had a job. I said, I said yeah, that's right. I mean, it was so funny. And I said to him, you know, Mr. Sorensen, I, I recently bought your latest book called Why I Am a Democrat. And now that I've talked with you, would you permit me to send you the book so that you could sign it for me. I'd be very honored if you would. He said, sure. So I sent him the book, and it came back a couple of days later. And inside, it said, to Barry Evanschick, from, with best regards, Ted Sorensen. And below that, it said, always remember, many are called, but few are chosen. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I thought that that episode was the result of my friend Jim Zizali's tendency on occasion to be a bit of a practical joker. And I called Jim Zizali as soon as I could get a hold of him and said, you did this. He said, Barry, I didn't. It's something that I could do, but I didn't do it. And he assured me, and I believe him because he would have no reason to deny it if in fact he did it. I never figured out who, who did it, but in any event, that's uh, that's a long-winded story of involving Ted Sorensen mm -hmm. and the White House and, and my career. Any other Washington recollections before we fast forward again to the prosecution? Only days? one. I, I, I was uh, dating that summer a, 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 a girl, we called them girls in those mm -hmm. days, who was a student also working at the Civil Rights Commission. And, and a fun thing to do in Washington in 1962 in the evening was to go up to the Capitol spread a blanket out on the lawn and listen to the band concerts. They used to have the service bands would perform almost every night and, and thousands of people would do it. It was just a fun thing to do. So one evening uh, we were up there uh, waiting for the uh, band concert to begin, a huge assemblage. And a couple came along and this man stops at where we were seated on the, on the, on the grass and he said, excuse me, aren't you Philip Roth? Now, Philip Roth by then was famous. He had written Goodbye Columbus, mm 
which had sold you know, millions, and he was already established as a, as a brilliant young American author. And I had read Goodbye Columbus, and I had already become a Philip Roth fan by this time. And I said to this man, no, I'm not Philip Roth. I just read his book. And uh, this fellow looked at his wife and looked at me. He said, you are Philip Roth. <laughs> he said, I'm not. And as he walked away, I could, I could hear him say to his wife, son of a bitch. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, it's the only time in my life I've ever been mistaken for a celebrity. And I looked at the picture on the back of the book of Philip Roth, and I could see a little resemblance maybe around the eyes. I don't think I'm a, the spitting image, as they say, of Philip Roth, but, but that's a memorable thing that happened. Mm -hmm. I, I, uh, I caught Potomac fever when I worked in Washington, meaning I wanted more than anything after law school to work. As I told you, I wanted to be in the Kennedy White House <clears throat> or be someplace in Washington. That didn't happen, but my experience as a student working in Washington was, was, was really extraordinary. Kennedy had inspired so many young people uh, towards a career in government. I mean, it was, it was just something that people thought about doing in large measure because of the allure and prestige, if you will, that Kennedy brought uh, to, to the world of politics. Um, whatever else you might say about Kennedy and all the things that we've learned in the years that followed, he was uh, just a magnet for young people. And very honestly, I, I think about that and I, and I look at what goes on these days in politics. You almost wonder what would motivate a young person today to want to get into politics given all of the inevitable dirt that flies around and so forth. But in any event, I caught Potomac fever but never ended up working in Washington. Mm -hmm. Barry, before we move back to the Brendan Byrne days, why don't you talk a little bit about your family and your upbringing? You've already said that it was a little bit of a struggle to raise the money to go to school, but expand on your, your background. Yeah, my, uh, my dad um, never finished high school. He was, uh, found himself an orphan when he was about 15. He had one brother and five sisters, and he kind of came up through the streets of Newark in those days and uh, ended up uh, and spent the rest of his life working in the uh, wholesale plumbing and heating supply business, first for his brother-in-law and then later for various other people. Um, my mom did not work, but uh, I have a uh, sister who's nine years younger, one sister, and um, as I said earlier, we, we I grew up in, in Newark, um, uh, and when I was 12 years old, my sister was three, my family moved to Milburn. Um, my dad, uh, you know, was a working person all of his life, did not have any money to speak of. Uh, I remember how proud he was when they were finally able to buy their first home and move to Milburn. In fact, uh, Milburn in those days had about 13,000 people in it. And my father worked in Dover. He used to commute from Newark to Dover every day. And when he bought the house before the closing, I learned later, he would often, uh, coming down Route 10 or whatever route he took in those days, he would get off and go into Milburn and drive down Wyoming Avenue to, s to see the house that would soon be his. And after he did this two or three times, one evening a police, Milburn police car pulled him over. <laughs> An alert policeman had observed that he didn't belong there and yet kept going by the house. And when we moved, uh, I remember uh, how proud he was that he had been able to provide a, a home for his children. He was also very proud that he'd been able to see me through college and, and law school. It was one of his proudest moments. And indeed, while working for Brendan Byrne in 1967, the time of the Newark riots, uh, I was assigned to uh, go to the federal court in Newark and argue before a three-judge federal court uh, a case that had arisen from the riots involving the indictment of, of an individual. Uh, and, and that person was, was uh, represented by a well-known lawyer named Oliver Lofton. 
And the question before the court was whether the indictment should be invalidated because the makeup of the grand jury may have been racially skewed. We argued the case before a crowded courtroom in Newark, and I remember even now with a bit of a tear in my eye as I looked around. My dad was there in the courtroom. I think it was the only time he ever saw me perform as a lawyer. Uh, and after the argument, which took all morning, the federal judges said, we'll reserve decision. And as I was packing up my papers, somebody tapped me on the shoulder. <clears throat> and he said, my name is Jerome Wilson. I'm with CBS Television. We'd like to do a sidewalk interview with, of you and Mr. Lofton. And so it all happened so fast I didn't even have time to get nervous. I went downstairs to the street outside the courthouse. In those days, a sidewalk interview involved a vehicle the size of a Greyhound bus filled with equipment, wires, all kinds of things. I mean, it wasn't today, a television camera is this big. This was a whole major league event. And as Mr. Wilson interviewed us, I could see out of my peripheral vision my dad standing a few feet away watching proudly. Here's his son now on television. And that night, I indeed was on the 6 o'clock news, the Jim Jensen report, my one and only time you know, ever on the 6 o'clock news. And as I say, it was a proud moment for my dad because he had seen his hard work in part come to fruition. Uh, sadly, he didn't live uh, to, to be any, he died at age 58. I was um, in the National Guard. Uh, I had just left for my two-week encampment up at Camp Drum, and my parents were going to Massachusetts to a family wedding, and they didn't have an air-conditioned car, and I did. So I said to my dad, why don't you take my car, and, and, he, and he did. And, and I was up in my tent up at Camp Drum, and it was about midnight, and I heard a voice you know, in the woods saying, uh, Lieutenant Evanchik, and uh, um, I knew something. He said, you have an emergency phone call. And I knew full well it was, couldn't be good news. I thought immediately of my wife and my two little children, and I figured something has happened, and I was really upset. I went, they took me to the phone, <clears throat> and it was my sister to say that they had been on their way home to the hotel from the wedding, and my dad had suffered a heart attack and died. And um, as I say, he was 58, and it was, it was a shock. Uh, he had just seen his daughter, my kid sister, married, and for the first time probably in his life, was relatively free of you know, financial pressures, and this would have been a time for him to begin to really enjoy uh, the fruits of his labors. Sadly, he died. Um, but um, that National Guard event, by the way, ties in to my friend Ray Brown, uh, Raymond M. Brown. I always forget who the father is and who the son is, but one the father. Is and one is P. Well, whichever one is the older fella, when I was a young assistant prosecutor working in the prosecutor's office under Brendan Byrne, Ray Brown was busy trying cases all over the place. And he would often come down to the appellate room where I worked after court and just kind of tell war stories. And we all enjoyed hearing Ray Brown's war stories. One day I said to him, say, Ray, you're the staff judge advocate of the 50th Armored Division, and I'm a PFC in a signal unit in Orange. Don't you need a lawyer in your, in your section? And he said, yeah. You know, Barry, I'd love to have you in my section. But you're a PFC. I, I mean, I, we're colleagues in the law. He said, what am I going to have you do, clean latrines? He said, if you were an officer, I would be happy to see you in the section. And then Ray, being Ray, thought a minute, and he said, that no good blankety blank so and so, the commanding general of the 50th Armored Division, owes me a couple of favors. He said, I'll see you tomorrow. The next day he came and said, I called General Wolf, I think was his name. And I said to him, You know, we need a direct commission program in the National Guard. And, he's, and he said, You're, We're going to have that program. And so it came to pass that a fellow named Sam Lord, who's a lawyer with the Connell Foley firm, uh, Bill Greenberg, who was, and I think still is, with MacArthur in English, 
and a guy named Bob Abrams, a lawyer in Monmouth County, and I became the first members of the New Jersey National Guard to, be, to receive direct commissions in the JAG Corps, in the Staff Judge Advocate's Office. And so I, I went one Sunday afternoon from a PFC to a first lieutenant <coughs> and, and thus began my, my military JAG career. <coughs> Excuse me. The terms of this commission were that you had to agree to stay in for another six years and go to Camp Drum for two years and then also to the University of Virginia Law School where the Judge Advocate General's College was and take two, two weeks of that each summer, which we all did and enjoyed it. And, uh, and, and that's, that's my military career briefly. Do you want to take a short break? Sure. My goodness. Barry, let's uh, push again to the prosecutor days. You join the office, get to know Brendan Byrne a little bit better. Talk about him as uh, head of the office and as a boss. He was um, a little bit aloof, at least that was the perception. Aloof now, looking back, may not be the appropriate word. But there was anything but the warm and fuzzy relationship between, certainly between uh, many of us, and I can speak for myself, and, and Byrne. We respected him, admired him greatly. But I certainly didn't feel any close personal relationship. Um, there always seemed to be a distance, which I thought was probably intentional on his part. I mean, he was the boss. He was respected, but I didn't feel any, any particular closeness in those early days. Um, he, I remember living in fear, if you, if you got a memo from the boss, as we called him with affection in those days, if it said, see me, those two words, see me, you knew you had done something wrong. <laughs> the words see me were not terrific. Um, and um, I, I remember uh, one time uh, being called into his office after he had argued a case in the state Supreme Court on a brief that I had written, or with a brief that I had written. And his eyes kind of narrowed and he said to me, I argued this case and this was a bad brief and you could have put a dagger into me to have the boss tell me that the brief was a bad brief. And he critiqued it. He said, you didn't say this and you should have said that. And I was just devastated. Happily, that's about the only such experience I remember having of a negative sort. But the point is that um, he was extremely bright. We all knew that. He had this great sense, in John McPhee's words about Bradley, he had a great sense of where he was at all times. I remember once he called me into the office and he said, uh, we're going to file a brief for the United States Supreme Court on the, in this particular case, and I want you to say in the very opening paragraph, this is a case that has attracted great media attention. And I said to him, but boss, you, you know, you don't put that in a United States Supreme Court brief. And I learned then what I, what I came to know quite well. His, again, the eyes narrowed and he said to me, I said, put that into the first paragraph. I didn't argue. And I did, and of course the U.S. Supreme Court granted review of the case. So we all knew that Brendan was just a guy who, who had a tremendous ability to do the right thing. And that ability manifested itself in a number of ways. For example, as a prosecutor, he was not above standing before a court and admitting to a mistake. And he did that on more than one occasion, either a mistake or acknowledging that the defendant's position was really the fair and just one. And that was not the typical response of a prosecutor before a court. But Brendan was not the typical prosecutor. He always did, and this is part of why we all so respected him. He always did what was right in, in the law, and in running the office and, uh, and 
That was his reputation. And that's at least in part why that office uh, had the great prestige that it did. To have worked for Brendan Byrne was, was really an honor and a privilege. And um, he had this incredible ability to inspire loyalty, enormous loyalty. I dare say you could talk to any one of the persons who worked for Byrne in those years as an assistant prosecutor, and everybody would be of one mind. I mean, they really worship the ground he walks on. We're right now um, uh, planning uh, another, what we're calling the Brendan Byrne reunion, reunion of those who worked for him in the prosecutor's office. I just had lunch a week or so ago with Bill McGuire, Andy Zazali, uh, and Rich McGlynn. And we had lunch to plan this reunion, which we hope is going to take place on March 1st. Everyone who ever worked for Brendan Byrne is, is, is just of the same mind. It was special, and in large part because he's special. As I say, I don't know what the formula is for this. I wish I did. But he has this ability to cause everyone around him to not only be fond of him personally, but to respect him and to enjoy the opportunity to work for him. I'm sure that you would agree that that's also true of the people who worked for him when he was governor. I had occasion to work for him at the Public Utility Commission after he left the prosecutor's office and I left with him. And uh, the same was true then. So at every step along the way, um, the devotion and the admiration for Byrne is just palpable. It's just extraordinary. As you joined the office as one of the junior assistant prosecutors, what were you asked to do? I was asked to handle post-conviction relief applications, which, which were, in those days, uh, they, they would bring them in on Monday morning in a box. Prisoners who were out in various institutions in the state could jot in longhand uh, an application for a new trial. It was called a post-conviction relief application. And all they had to do was write such a thing, and they'd get a hearing. And part of my work at the beginning was to, was to handle those. I was also writing briefs and arguing appellate before the appellate division and the Supreme Court and, um, and um, did that for some weeks. And one day, uh, Brendan asked me if I would like a chance to try some jury cases. And I said, sure. I mean, I, I was enjoying doing appellate work, but I always felt that a lawyer worth his, his salt needs to be able to stand up and try a case before a jury. And when I got the opportunity, I seized upon it. And so for the next couple of years, I was doing both. I was writing appeals, uh, briefs, and arguing cases, and trying cases in the, in the trial courts. And that gave me a broad experience, which I treasure. I mean, I, Brendan used to say, you can get your experience at the expense of the taxpayers, after all. If you're going to make mistakes now, make them. Uh, and it, for all of us who had a chance to, to, do, to work in the prosecutor's office, it was, it was a great opportunity to get experience. And, um, and, and I guess it was in uh, the end of 1967 or so when Governor Hughes named Brendan to the Public Utility Commission, thus bringing to a conclusion his about nine years as prosecutor. And that generates a story that I'll share with you. Um, well, before we go to that point, yeah. why don't we stay with the prosecutor days and talk about one of the major incidents uh, during that time and during New Jersey's history, the Newark riots and the role of the Essex County prosecutor and Brendan Byrne and yourself in, yeah. in, the, in the aftermath of the riots. The riots broke out, as I recall, in July of 1967. It was a horrific time in Newark's history, in Essex County's history, in the state's history. Um, my first awareness of the riots came on a day when I was over in New York on a, on a continuing legal education panel someplace. 
and talking about criminal law, and someone handed me a note and said, uh, you're to call Prosecutor Byrne right away, and I, I did, and I was told that riots or hell was breaking loose. And I went back uh, to Newark, and, and we, the whole office became involved in, in those awful days. Um, for Byrne, it called upon him in a way that he had never before experienced. This was not just a terrible social upheaval, but people were getting killed. I mean, it was just the worst imaginable. No one had experienced this kind of thing before. I remember uh, the National Guard kids really had been called out and they were stationed on every corner in downtown Newark with rifles and they didn't even know what to do with them. And all of this had a, an unreal atmosphere to it, or surreal. But nonetheless, it was serious. People, Newark was burning. People were getting shot. It was a horrible time. And I recall um, I was at home, I think, on the first Saturday after the riots broke out. And I experienced then the uh, ability of Brendan Byrne, which happily I had not seen before and I haven't seen since, to, to have a genuine temper tantrum. What happened was I was at home. My wife was out shopping. We had one car. I was babysitting for our daughter. And the riots now were in full bloom. Phone rings and it's burned. And his voice etched with anger, he said to me, why do I have a letter on my desk from Chief Justice Weintraub telling me that our brief in the Galicchio case is late? <laughs> I said, boss, Rich McGlynn is handling that case. And he absolutely lost it. He said to me, don't tell me Rich McGlynn is handling the case. I have you in the office to answer for these things. And he just screamed. And I will tell you that when that call ended, I was truly shaking. I thought I was about to be fired. And, and I mean that. My wife got home, and I said, I've got to get down to Newark to see the boss. I mean, he's furious with me. And we had a new car. And I remember driving down to downtown Newark seeing the National Guard half-tracks driving down Springfield Avenue. It was an awful time. And I figured any minute I'm going to get shot. I know, I know I'll never make it to the courthouse, you know. But I did make it to the courthouse. Nervously went in to find Byrne and hopefully make some amends for this. Well, when I got to his office, someone said to me, no, the prosecutor has just gone down to City Hall for a meeting with Mayor Adonisio. So I didn't get to talk to him that Saturday. And believe me, the rest of the weekend was a fitful one for me. I was just beside myself with upset. Monday morning, I went down to the courthouse. And when I saw Byrne, it was as if this had never happened. It turned out I happened to be the relief valve for all the pressures that had been building up. And it was my misfortune to, to be the recipient of that. But uh, it was the one and only time I, I I, as I say, I was, I was on the receiving end of, of a real bit of burn temper. Um, we still look back on those days. I've never forgotten them, as you can see, and, and he smiles and we, we laugh about it. But the Newark riots were, were ugly. Um, and when uh, things had, when the shooting stopped, there were various court cases that began, including one that I mentioned a bit earlier, it took me down to the federal court in Newark uh, to argue a case. And interestingly, uh, on the Friday before the Monday that this federal court case occurred, Byrne had come back from a prosecutor's meeting he had been at for two days out of the state. And I went into his office and I said, boss, I just want to, in fairness, make you aware that this federal court case on Monday in Newark has attracted media attention. I have reason to believe CBS television will be there and so forth. And obviously, you may want to handle this yourself. I was hoping he wouldn't. And indeed, he said to me, no, it's OK. You go handle it. And, and, so, and so I did. And um, that's how come I managed to get myself on the 6 o'clock news. But you know, looking back so many years later,
That little episode illustrates in its own way Burns' kindness. Um, he knew full well that this was a chance for me, a young assistant, to get a moment of, in the sunshine, so to speak. He was used to publicity. He had plenty of it. And he could, I have no doubt that he said to me, no, you go handle it for one reason, and that was to give me a chance to get a little glory. Uh, Byrne, I learned then and have come to know so well since, is an incredibly decent human being with a sense of humanity and that is in some ways unequaled. Uh, he's really very special. During the first days of the riots, did you feel sort of a sense of siege that you weren't sure how this was all going to yeah, work it, out? It, yes. Um, my job, along with another assistant who later became my law partner named Joel Sondak, was to handle bail applications. Now, a bail application is ordinarily a rather routine event in, in, in a criminal matter, but people were being arrested by the truckload in Newark, people who weren't really criminals but who somehow got caught up in the almost carnival atmosphere. I remember um, that as the sheriff's people brought these individuals in to be processed and they came before the judge for the bail application. Many of them were people like you and me. I mean, they were, they were good folks who somehow, you know, got caught up in it. By that I mean, you know, there were incidents in which somebody was walking down the street, the storefront would, would, had been blown out, and, and, and so somebody reached in and, and, and took a portable radio. There was nobody around. There was nothing to... That ended up being the subject, of course, of, a, of an arrest and a criminal charge. Uh, and not to suggest that everyone fell into this category, but many people had no criminal background, no, none whatsoever, and yet they get caught up in this thing. And the bail applications that we handled uh, started out, I remember uh, uh, th that uh, the judge who was, they had taken a, a, a gymnasium in the county jail and converted it into a temporary courtroom. And there was a judge by the name of Stamler who was new to Essex County at the time, and he was handling the bail applications. I was the assistant prosecutor, and they were bringing these prisoners in, and it was taking 15 minutes per application. And while this was all happening, around the perimeter of the gym, the sheriff's department had been lining up these prisoners. Judge Ralph Fusco came in and, and called Judge Stamler and me outside into the hallway. And he said to Judge Stamler, Joe, you're a new judge. At the rate we're going, we'll, we'll be here in the next millennium. Let me, let me show you how to do this. He borrows Stamler's robe, and we go back inside, and now Judge Fusco is hearing the bail applications. And I would stand up and say, Your Honor, the defendant is charged with released on his own recognizance. Next case. And so it went. That was, you know, the lighter aspect of this, but in truth, the Newark, they called them, so they called them disorders at one time. They were, they were riots. Newark burned up. Downtown Newark still in places shows the effect of this horrible thing. It was, it was just the result, I guess, of years of tension and pressure, and it just took whatever it took to ignite the city. And some 20-odd people lost their lives in, in those riots. It was horrible. Of course, your experience with Professor Ferguson and in Washington at the Civil Rights Commission, did that sort of put you in a special situation where you viewed as somewhat more understanding of the basic problems in Newark well, within the office? I, I don't know if I was viewed that way, but I can tell you that I felt that way. I mean, my experience in, in part with Professor Ferguson, and one of my closest friends in law school was Stanley Van Ness, also an African American. I can say without any ulterior motives, I, I never had and still don't an, an ounce of feeling of prejudice or bias. To me, people are people, and, and I take them for what they are. And I don't say that to throw bouquets at myself, but because my upbringing, my experience 
early years as a lawyer brought me in close contact with all sorts of folks. Um, I think that helped me maybe develop a sense of fairness and a sense of what's right and wrong. But as I say, I, I don't claim any premium on that market or any corner on that market. There were others, certainly, with whom I worked who, who were equally uh, understanding and whose feelings were, were no different. But, um, but in any event, uh, yeah, I think that my experience with Professor Ferguson and with others at least helped me develop a sense of fairness that I hope found its way into, the, uh, into my work as an assistant prosecutor, uh, particularly in the riots. Uh, you mentioned Stanley Van Ness as a law school classmate. Now, at this point during the Newark riots, Stanley is working on the staff of Governor Hughes, who comes up to Newark to try to assess the situation. Did you have any contact with Stanley then? I don't believe I did, um, no. Um, of course, I knew him, but I, I did not as I recall now, have any contact with, with Stan or indeed with Governor Hughes. They were at a level higher than I was in those days, and uh, so I didn't. Um, but um, I remember that Stan was involved uh, with the governor at that time. As an observer, how did you assess the decision-making at the time, either by the governor or by the state police, in terms of confronting the situation? Well, you know, the, the, this, what we were confronted with was the aftermath of decades, I suppose, of rising tensions. The immediate problem was to end the riots. The uh, policies and, and approaches that were to follow, you know, came later. I think what was important, aside from putting an end to the violence, was to develop a plan. And I pay tribute to Governor Hughes, uh, to my friend Stan, uh, 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 Sandy Jaffe, who was the executive director of the riot commission in those days, and also a former employee of Governor Byrne uh, in the prosecutor's office. Uh, Sandy Jaffe, as I say, was the executive director of the riot commission. Um, under his executive directorship and under, I forget now who the members of the commission were, but, but that riot report in turn generated policy changes and approaches to the enforcement of law, but from a, a, a social, uh, from a humane standpoint. Um, not to suggest that everything then became wonderful after the riots, but things began to turn around a bit in terms of race relations. Um, you know, if you looked around uh, offices like the prosecutor's office and any other governmental offices in the early 60s, you didn't see very many African Americans. You didn't see many women either. Um, but uh, that began to change, not just in Newark, but, you know, in our state, throughout the country. And, and as ugly and as terrible as the riots were, I, in their own way, I suppose they helped to generate that social change. And, uh, and that was important. And within the prosecutor's office, of course, your primary responsibility is to prosecute people who are accused of crimes. But you've mentioned that many of the people who sort of came through the system didn't seem to be very criminal in your sort of evaluation. Uh, was that difficult, prosecuting some of these people? Uh, yeah, but I will tell you that those people in, in particular, some of those caught up in the riots, um, ended up really not being prosecuted. When the dust settled, many of those people uh, were either given probationary sentences, very light, or the complaints actually, in some instances, were dismissed. Only the more serious matters were actually prosecuted. Um, but again, and I, I really pay tribute to Brendan Byrne for this, the mentality in the Essex Prosecutor's Office was to see to it that justice was done. And that may sound trite, but it was true in the case of the Essex Prosecutor's Office. Not to prosecute, but to do it fairly and to make sure that, to the extent we could, that justice was done. I remember well a case in which um, uh, I found myself before the Supreme Court on behalf of Prosecutor Byrne uh, 
and I told the court that the prosecutor's office felt that there had been an injustice done in this case. And I remember Chief Justice Weintraub saying, well, that leaves us without an adversary proceeding. And I said, well, that may be, but our office takes a position that the defendant is entitled to some relief. That was a refreshing way for a prosecutor's office to behave, and that's, that was Brendan Byrne. Um, more than once, uh, he walked into a courtroom to, as we called it in those days, to confess error, where he felt there had been an injustice done, and the defendant did not deserve to either be prosecuted or to be sent off someplace. Um, I remember a case known as the Mortimer Schultz case. Mortimer Schultz was a scoundrel who had busied himself selling shares in the Wiss Building, a downtown Newark office building. He was selling shares in the Wiss Building, and the only thing is he didn't own those shares. He got indicted and prosecuted. My present partner, Justin Walder, tried the case for the Essex County Prosecutor's Office. Schultz was convicted. I remember handling the appeal before the Supreme Court of New Jersey. Years later, Schultz was the subject of a federal habeas corpus application. He had filed this application some time after his conviction. He was in prison. And uh, Judge Augelli, the late Judge Augelli, then of the United States Federal District Court, issued an opinion that Schultz had been denied fundamental fairness in some respect and granted Schultz uh, a new trial and ordered him released pending a decision by the prosecutor's office on a new trial. Brendan called me in, and here again, what I'm about to tell you is an illustration of, of the basic decency and kindness of Brendan Byrne. He called me in and he said, I want you to go down to Judge Ogelli's and oppose, oppose the release of Schultz from prison. And he said, I'll tell you why. He said, I don't believe Mortimer Schultz was denied a fair trial. Um, he's been the subject of countless judges' opinions. And I don't think Judge Ogelli's decision is likely to stand up uh, under scrutiny and under appeal. But he said, I'm worried. Mortimer Schultz, if he gets released and then, you know, a month later is sent back to prison, he's very likely to, or may well, do harm to himself. I don't want to see that happen. I don't want that on my hands. See if Judge Ogelli will, will order him to remain while we decide on what we're doing. Now, you can say that, well, he was a prosecutor, he didn't want the man released. That isn't why he didn't want him released. He really was worried about the effect if, as was likely, Schultz would end up being rearrested. Well, Judge Ogelli let him out anyway, but the point I'm getting at is that there is that special sense of decency that runs throughout Brendan Byrne that, that extended out to all of us who worked for him, which is unusual. I don't, I'm not going to say it's unique, but it, at least it was unusual.